My name is Rosanna Parati. I'm a professor in the political science department here, and I want to welcome you to this talk to students and friends. Uh, political Science Talks Politics. This is the third installation, Polling 101. Um, and we have Dr. Craig Burnett, Associate Professor and Calico School Poll Program Director delivering this talk. Uh, before we get started, I want to say first that this is the third in this small series of talks this semester. The series will continue next semester um, with talks about various aspects of politics. I want to say at the outset, thank you to the folks who have helped to put this on uh, from University Relations and the Hofstra Cultural Center to uh, Professor Mina Bose uh, who, and the Peter S. Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency who are co-sponsoring this program. Um, introducing Dr. Burnett, he has been a professor in our department for a very short time, and in that very short time, he has given so much of himself, and we appreciate so much the expertise that he's added to our, um, our faculty. He teaches courses in state and local politics and also in political methodology, and for years, he's been interested in and active in polling and the measurement of public opinion is one of his major interests, uh, as is of the study of democracy, direct democracy. So let me hand the podium to him, um, Dr. Craig Burnett. Thank you, Dr. Parati, and, and doubling the thanks to everybody who's, who's helped make this happen. Um, when this idea came about, uh, there was a sense that you know, there might be a little bit of a gap in between you know, what the public's knowledge is about polling, yet it's fair to say, I think, that we're inundated with polls. You know, every day I can refresh various websites and see anywhere between eight and 10 polls have, have, have released information. And this is, this is my attempt to kind of help everyone else make sense out of this. I love this stuff and I follow it closely, but you know, there are some sort of best practices and some tools that I think everybody can use when it comes to uh, looking and understanding exactly what they're looking at. So that's what, that's what this talk is about. And, uh, we, will, we will go through a lot of topics because polling is complicated. It's changing and probably changing even more in the last 10 years than I think um, it has ever done in probably any 10 year period before. Uh, so I, I can't tell you exactly what I think the next 10 years is gonna look like, but it'll certainly be a lot different from now. So yeah, I, 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 I tend to practice what I preach and I always tell people you have about a minute of their attention before they start doing something else, whether it's playing on their phones or it's uh, you know just drifting off into space and thinking about something else. So if you don't remember anything else from this talk, here's what I want you to know. Polls are a snapshot in time. This means that they are, for the time period in which they are taken, the best representation we can get. It does not mean they were valid for anything that happened before or anything that's going to come in the future. Second, polls are still valid and they're still valuable. There's been some discussion about this and we'll talk about this as we get into the nitty gritty, but they are in fact still useful. And so the discussion I think that has been coming uh, from various places in the, in the public about whether or not they're still useful, I think is, is misguided. And then finally, uh, polling will continue to face challenges uh, as it evolves over time. I think this is a given. I think the challenges are unique to this particular time in the way that society is changing. I do think that we'll figure it out, but it is in fact going to be a significant challenge. So here's the general outline of the talk. We'll talk about really the sort of start of it all. How did we get to modern public opinion research? You know, what, what sort of brought this about? Then I'll take you through a very brief discussion of how public opinion and research has evolved over time. We'll talk about how to construct a poll, then we'll talk about how to read a poll. We'll talk about trends, and then we'll talk about what are the challenges that are facing public opinion research. Well, then we'll throw in some fun sort of things as like, where else can you get measures of political 
opinion, and so I'll, I'll show you a betting market and what that's about. Uh, and then we'll conclude with a discussion of can I trust public opinion polls? So whenever we talk about modern uh, public opinion research, most people will start with the story of Literary Digest. And so Literary Digest, for those of you who are not familiar with it, was for its time one of the most widely read news magazines in the country. And in 1927, it had a circulation of over 1 million. The way to think about this is that Literary Digest is sort of similar to Time Magazine was uh, more near its height of power. Uh, it was well known for lots of things. It was sort of an amalgam of, of, of interests. But one of the things it became extremely well known for is a straw poll. And what it would do is it would send out these sorts of cards you can see here on the, uh, the bottom right here. Uh, this is what they would send out to people. They would send it out to their readers, and they would send it out to addresses that were associated with other readership lists. And they were hoping that they would be able to get people to respond and tell them how they think they're going to vote, and then they would use that information to make a prediction about the, the upcoming election. Turns out it was, it was generally OK most of the time, but there are inherent problems with straw polls, right? They're not necessarily representative. And this is, uh, this is going to be their problem and ultimate downfall. Uh, in 1936, they get to about 10 million people. So this is not some small amount of people that they've contacted. This is actually a huge number, right? They get 2.4 million people to respond. Awesome sample size. You would say to yourself, if I could get 2.4 million responses today, boy, what could I do with that data? So this sounds, by the numbers, uh, pretty impressive. But it was anything but perfect. So this is the poll that they ran in 1936, and they come up with a formula you know, just adding together and seeing exactly who's going to win. You know, why wouldn't they? Um, you remember President Landon, don't you? <laughs> Clearly, he's just somebody who's been thrown aside to the dustbin of history. No, 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 there was no President Landon. But they thought there would be in 1936. And they found that to be a margin of uh, millions of votes, in fact. And this is the response the week after uh, the election. They find out that. Uh, uh, they were wrong, and they weren't just wrong. They were significantly wrong by a big margin. So uh, this actually is uh, the beginning of the end of Literary Digest. This, this discredits them so widely that they actually just go out of business shortly thereafter. Um, also during the 1936, uh, we see George Gallup first introduced, and this is sort of starting for him as kind of a hobby. Uh, he, he wasn't uh, really traditionally interested in public opinion. But he also runs a, a poll in 1936, and he only uses 50,000 respondents. But he does it in a different way. Right? He goes to each state, and he tries to gather a representative sample from each of the states. Because he understands, unlike what Literary Digest did not, is that, in fact, it's not just sheer numbers that matters, but it's who's voting and where. And so with 50,000, he actually predicts pretty clearly that Roosevelt's going to win. The interesting thing that he also does is that he correctly predicts the Literary Digest results because he mimics their sampling method. So in both cases, he was right. Roosevelt won the actual election, and he was able to successfully predict that Literary Digest would get it wrong. So what went wrong? Straw polls are not scientific. So we don't really do straw polls in a significant way anymore. Probably the most significant one that any major news headline would, would grab would be maybe the Iowa straw poll. And that's only because they're the first state. But, but you know, coming with that is everybody understands it's not scientific. The problem, particularly with Literary Digest, was that they had what's called non-response bias. And that was the response rate was only 24%. So most, you know, a, almost a lion's share of their uh, surveys did not get a response. Second is they had a selection bias. This is because this is 1936, so we're at the height of the Depression. One of the first things that goes away when it's time to cut your budget because there's a Depression on are things you don't need, which would happen to be subscriptions to Literary Digest and, and, and subscriptions in general. So these sorts of extraneous items and their polling lists and their contact lists were, ge were generally biased toward people who had money, who were doing reasonably well during, uh, the, uh, during the Depression. And I don't want to say that 
That means that we should then crown Gallup the king and you know never think that they can ever do anything wrong because they clearly had. Uh, in 1948, they actually did predict that Dewey was going to defeat Truman as well. Uh, Gallup says uh, that the reason he was so wrong is he stopped polling a couple weeks before the election. So everybody gets it wrong some of the time is the lesson to take away from this. So now we'll talk a little bit about a brief history of where we've gone with methodology. The first method that really kind of everybody was doing at the beginning of sort of academic research or in the case of Gallup or Literary Digest, was either in-person or mail-based surveys. These are, these are expensive methods, right? Because they require you to either use the mail service or in cases of in-person, somebody to travel. You have to put them up, transportation costs, food, etc. Extremely expensive, and they have to be carefully done. The second that sort of changed the way that we fundamentally do public opinion research is through the telephone, right? This was in 1936, not yet quite in every household. Uh, it wasn't necessarily understood that you could do these sorts of things. But what happens is the advent of sort of the telephone is belonging, it is now has a place in everybody's household. You can randomly dial numbers and get a random house. And if you do this enough times, you end up with a nice representative sample. Everybody has the same probability to end up in the sample. You don't have to worry about things like cluster sampling. And this is sort of revolutionary because it's a lot cheaper, right? You don't have to do mail. You just, you just get on the phone. You make a phone call. Sure, you might have some sort of things like uh, you know, long distance fees. This is going to be uh, a stretch of the imagination for, our, for the young people in the audience. But in fact, uh, <laughs> this was a cheaper way to do things. And it worked, and it worked really well, and it totally revolutionized the way that we do it. The problem was is that uh, nobody saw the cell phone coming. Right? We all knew that we liked them when we first got our hands on them, uh, but the fact of the matter is nobody ever predicted that we would ever give up, give up our landlines. And this has created a problem for public opinion research, that you cannot rely upon random digit dialing anymore. Just by a show of hands, how many of you guys have a landline that is not your parents? Okay, we got a couple. I see four, five, six, and we got a full house here. So, uh, what is this? 120 people or so. So, I mean, you know, you do the math, but it's not good, right? So, those are the people who are eligible to even be called. Uh, let's not even get into the fact that if you get a call on your landline, what's the operating assumption? It's a spam, right? Yeah. So you wouldn't answer it anyway. So. That gets us to the future and where we're sort of on to next, right? And that's the online format. And this has its own set of challenges and it has its own set of biases, but it's extremely cheap. And more and more and more, it is the case that people have access to online formats, whether it's through your phone, whether it's through your computer. So this is where the next frontier of public opinion research is going to be. And it's in many ways, it's already here. And so, that's not to say that some, you know, that, that there's still a value in doing telephone surveys. There certainly is. Um, it's also a value to doing in-person interviews or mail-based surveys too. They all have their advantages and they all have their challenges. So let's talk about how we put a poll together. The first thing that we would do is define our population. Who are we trying to get after? Who are we trying to say something about? Right? That could be a lot of different things. It could be the entire world is depicted here. It could be uh, adults in America. It could be children in America. It could be uh, voters, which is typically what we're most likely after. Like we're typically after, when we talk about public opinion polls, we're after likely voters. Not just people who are registered, right? even though we want to know what they, they think too, but we're actually interested in the people who we think are going to show up on election day. Right? Those are the ones that are going to be casting their ballots. Ultimately, those are the ones that are uh, going to be deciding who the winner is. And so this is what most polls are after, especially polls that are trying to predict outcomes. Then we create a questionnaire. Right? So this is where you would sit back and you would think to yourself, what is the point of this survey? Is this trying to predict the outcome of an election? Is it more focused on policy? Is it a mix of both? And then you build out your questionnaire based on that, right? That is 
how you would think about, you first set the goal, you set a parameter about what you hope to be able to say something about, and it should be focused, right? You shouldn't just ask about everything because you can. Chances are you want to be able to say something very specifically. But I do want to add this point, which is question wording is an art. It's not a science. And anytime you write a question, chances are you are going to build in to that some sort of bias or some sort of push or some sort of pull that is going to cause answers to change. That's just the truth. There is no predefined way to do this. So when you read a poll from somebody even like the New York Times or CBS, those questions are designed by people and those people carry with them all of the thoughts, all of their history, and all of the biases that they have with them. So the goal of a, of a pollster, at least one that's trying to do their job well, is to in fact write a question as cleanly as possible with as least bias as possible. But it is never a science. I cannot tell you that any question ever asked is a perfect question. There's just no such thing. Then, after you've done all that, you've set your population parameters, you've set up your questionnaire, then you draw a sample, right? And so there are many ways to do this. It depends on which method you're doing. It could be a mixed method approach, it could be you're calling all landlines, it could be some landlines, some cell phones could be that you're calling a mix of cell phones, landlines, and also maybe doing an online component with that. That seems to be more and more at least the way the academic research is going. But it's a sample, right? And it's like dropping a bucket into the well. You're not going to get all of the water out, but you're going to get some of the water out. And you're hoping that that water looks like the rest of the water that's down there. And chances are it will, right? If you're doing your, if you're doing your job well and your sampling scheme is drawing as good of a representative sample as possible, that should be true. That doesn't mean that you can't possibly pull a bad sample. Certainly it happens, and it'll happen again, and it'll happen to even the best pollsters. It's just the fact of life. But if you're doing it as best you can, this should be true. So in telephone research, you generally are going to go down to, and I'm focusing on these because these are the two most predominant me uh, methods out there, random digit dialing of landline and cell phones, um, and I should be clear here, you can still random digit dial landlines. You are not allowed to randomly digit dial cell phones. So that means that somebody who's doing a cell phone based survey, or, or at least part of it, means that somebody is operating that on the other end of the line who's punching that number in, physically punching it, instead of having a computer do it. It's a very um, precise definition of the law that keeps them from doing random digit dialing of cell phones. So if you're wondering why you haven't been uh, surveyed by a major polling organization, you only have a cell phone, that could be why. It typically means they have to buy a list of cell phones and then choose from that list. So maybe you're not on that list yet, but you probably will be soon. And then finally, for online, there's two methods. There's a probability-based and then a non-probability-based methodology. Probability-based is still probably considered the gold standard, although it's a little bit more difficult to do. Why? Because we know that some populations are less likely to be online than others. And so you have to do something about that. So probability-based uh, polling outfits, uh, of which there are a couple. I know, for example, uh, Ipsos does one. Um, I just was looking, and I think Pew also does some of this as well. They must incentivize the ability to be online to do this. So perhaps they're paying for their internet or in some cases actually providing the instrument like a computer to do that. So it's becoming less and less of a problem because cell phone adoption is so wide in, in today's society. But the fact of the matter is there's still some people who are less likely to do this. Probability-based means that you have at least the same, you have the same exact per, uh, percentage of possibility of making the sample. That's a more expensive way to do things because now you have to be able to define who those probability, who that is, and be able to randomly select from that. That's difficult. What we see more and more are the non-probability based samples. And they're not necessarily bad. Uh, in fact, many of them are extremely sophisticated, but it means that you did not, by definition, have the same probability of ending up in the sample as somebody in a probability based. And we'll dive into this a little bit more. But once you've done that, once you've gathered your sample, that's when you do the analysis, right? You analyze the data, you report the results, and then you think about how you want to publicize them. 
if you're a research arm of some sort of organization, chances are you're going to publish this. If you're Pew, you're going to put it on your website. You're going to make a lot of noise about it. Um, but even then, even if you have an in-house publication strategy, you're still going to want to reach out to newspapers. If you're more academically focused, you might think about an academic journal, television, radio. There's really all sorts of ways to do it. And really, the, life the lifespan of a poll sort of goes in phases. The immediate results are of interest, especially to newspapers and news outlets. Then they become something more interesting to academics and those who are sort of policy wonks after that, because the analysis gets more complicated and it gets more in depth. And it doesn't necessarily fit well with the sort of immediate nature that comes with publishing or it comes with uh, news, uh, the news cycle. So after the initial lifespan of the poll, it sort of evolves. And it becomes interesting to people like me and people like you, students who might actually work with the data. We have a poll. How do we read it? So here we've got uh, from about, about a week ago or so, two weeks ago, I guess, is when I pulled this. Um, polling data from a number of agents, uh, a number of polling agencies and the results therein. This is uh, comparing uh, Biden versus Trump in the general election. How do we read what we're looking at here? First thing first, this is a general election matchup and it is a national matchup, right? This is not some state. This is how they would do with a national sample of people. So first thing we'd want to do is look at the source. Do we understand who the source is? Does their name mean something to me? Is this reputable? Because not every survey that's out there has been done in a reputable way. And if you're not who sh sure who they are, it would probably make sense to do a little bit of research on them. In this case, we're looking at NBC News and the Wall Street Journal. These are two organizations that have been in the polling uh, industry for quite some time. I think we can trust them. Uh, in fact, most of these I'm very familiar with. I'm less familiar with Emerson, Emerson or IBD. Uh, Survey USA, I understand their methodology very well. Um, they're generally uh, a trusted agency. You may not have heard of them, but I have. Uh, and then Quinnipiac's on here as well. And yes, it's true, Fox News is a trusted pollster. I know it must be hard for some people who don't believe that, but it is in fact true. They're a legit polling. They, they follow all the standards of APOR. They are trying to do this as well as anyone else. They're doing the best that they can do. Now, keep in mind, I didn't say it was a foxnews.com poll where you go online and you fill out those polls that are on the front page of the survey. Those aren't valid, but Fox News as a pollster is a respected polling organization. So know where it comes from because it matters. Then look at the date range. And then keep in mind what I told you about a snapshot. This is when the survey data were collected. So this was the time frame. You have to think back to yourself, has anything major happened in this time frame that might change how these results are in the future? Chances are that's true, right? They're only as fresh as fresh can be, and then they're no longer really representative anymore. So for these dates, we're good. Then look at what was the method and to demystify what this is. That 720 is the number of respondents. There is no sort of perfect number of respondents I can tell you about. The fact of the matter is, it's gonna be different based on what you're actually trying to say, what your population is. In this case, 720 is fine. 720 is a perfectly valid number. The more you have, the smaller your margin of error is gonna be, but there is a a, a, a line of diminishing returns on this, and it happens somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 respondents. So you'll see that a lot of news agencies opt for this number of about somewhere between five to maybe 800 or so. And that's, that's a generally pretty cost-effective strategy of getting a smaller margin of error and spending the money. So this is 720, and then the RV after it means registered voters. Right, so this is not a likely voter sample. This is a registered voter sample. There are differences between the two. Just because you're registered to vote because, does not mean that you are actually going to vote. But it depends on what you're interested in at this point in time. And perhaps at the earlier part of the election cycle, you do want to know what registered voters are thinking. Me personally, I like the likely voters, but it, it's a little bit more expensive and a little more difficult to get the likely voters because there are fewer of them than there are registered voters. Then you look at the margin of error, right? and this is 3.7, 
we generally look at this as a plus or a minus effect. And the best way to do that uh, is to sort of dig into what is actually going on with this statistic. So those of you who thought you'd get away without any math today are in for it. So statistics are probabilistic. Let me say that again. Statistics are probabilistic. They're not deterministic. I can tell you something about a statistic and mean that there's a chance that this is going to happen. And that chance is pretty good. Do not bank on it. The margin of error is an estimate of that certainty. How certain am I of my probabilistic statement? So we usually take this to mean, in most standard forms, 95% certain. That's pretty good. I would take 95% all the time. How do I interpret that? 95 out of 100 times, I would expect the same result. That's what it means. So that means that 5 out of 100, it won't. That means that even with the best statistical power I can give you, if I'm using the 95% threshold, 5 out of 100 times, I'll be wrong. That doesn't mean the statistic was wrong. It doesn't mean my methods were bad. It just means it was one of those five. It happens. But you know, if I were to put it to you this way, if I told you I could predict a roulette table out outcome 95 out of 100 times, you would take that bet every time, even if I was wrong some of the time. Even if I was wrong five times in a row, and I asked you, do you want to take my roulette prediction, your answer would be absolutely. Now, if I was wrong six times in a row, you might start to question, maybe I'm just some sort of hustler who's lied to you and taken some of your money, which is a reasonable, reasonable thing to say. But in this case, if I can actually do this, you would take it and you'd walk away with and probably be arrested by the casino. So this is how it works. The margin of error is calculated based on this formula. And yes, that's math. I know. Look at that. It's square root. Oh, God, it's awful. Um, let's unpack this a little bit, shall we? P hat. Yeah, it's got a little hat on. Um, means that it's a sample proportion. That little hat means it's a sample, not a population proportion. That's all it means. It's not that complicated. It's just something the statisticians do to make sure they're clear about what they're talking about. Uh, so it's a sample proportion. OK. N is the number in the sample. We know that. I can give you that number. Right? It's not that complicated. I can give you the proportion number because I just, you know, I can tell you, like, you know, if I go back to the, 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 the Biden and, and, and the Trump uh, statistics, there's a proportion there, right? That's how much percentage did you get of the two party vote? Very simple. You can start plugging these in. As I tell my students, if you've ever baked a cake or have you ever followed any sort of recipe at all, that's all this is. This is a recipe, but it's in mathematical form. You just start baking the cake and you'll get the answer. Z then is that critical value for the desired level of confidence. Now, I think you know it's always pretty standard, and I always use the 95% confidence, right? That's good enough. Like I said, I take the, I take the roulette challenge every time. And I'm just telling you this, but you could look this up. The multiplier when z is 95 is 1.96. So now we have all the elements we need to figure out the margin of error. Right, so let's say we had uh, an example here. Uh, whatever proportion I was calculating uh, between two candidates, one of them is getting 50% of that. I have a sample of 1,500. I've given you now everything you need, right? 50 goes where the p hat is once and twice at the top, dividing by the n, which would be 1,500. And then once I'm done with that, I multiply that by the z, which is 1.96, and that gives you the margin of error. That's what you would do if you were writing this out mathematically with all those numbers in there. Shorten down to that, so 2.53. Or what we'd say plus or minus 2.53. And the plus or minus is important, but this is how it would play out. Uh, in the, we'll actually use the Biden example for this one. So Biden had 52.1% of the vote, according to this, of a national sample, compared to 41.9 for Trump. This is how you would think about it if you were just plotting this out on an xy axis. Right? Very straightforward. You'd, put, you'd plot the 50. Uh, and then you, or, sorry, sorry, I was reading the average there. What I meant to say was that Biden has 50, Trump has 41. You plot 50, and then you would add, 
according to them, their margin of error of 3.7. So the upper range of Biden's support in this poll is 53.7, right? That would be go mobile. That there, 53.7. Now, if you want to figure out the lower bound, within 95% confidence where Biden's support is, you subtract 3.7, 46.3. Then all you got to do is put Trump's number there. You plot it, 41. And do the same thing, plus 3.7, minus 3.7. Now you have 95% confidence bounds for both. And what we should be doing in our head, and if you want to, you can always draw this out the way I did. It's very easy. Think about those lines, those dashed lines in between them, where I'm putting the top end for Trump, and I'm putting the lower end from Biden, and I'm shooting out little dotted lines into space from there, and I'm looking to see if they cross over or if there's space between them. And there's space between them on this poll, which means that if the poll were conducted 95 out of 100 times, we would expect Biden to be in the lead. That's what that means. Please note, I did not say that this means Biden's going to win the election. It does not mean that it will be this exact number. It means that if we were to do this poll 95 more times with the same methods, with the same questions, with the same sampling frame, I would expect Biden to fall between somewhere between 53.7 and 46.3, 95 out of 100 times. I would mean I would think that Trump would fall somewhere between 44.7 and 37.3 in those same instances. In both of those cases, in both examples, Trump, however, would be losing, in quotes, to Biden on this national level sample. But that's how you read that. And that's what that means. It does not mean that I figured out the election and you should go and celebrate or not celebrate whatever you happen to be hoping the outcome to be. So national polls are fun. I enjoy them. You enjoy them. They're instructive. It's cool, it's cool to talk about who's winning. Horse races are, in fact, why most of us like politics so much, because it really does come down to two people. And, you know, we... We've partitioned ourselves in, in camps where we're Republicans or Democrats, and we root really hard for our teams now, and we root harder for our teams than we ever have before. Um, and that's fun. But it does very little to help us understanding who's going to win the election. right? So that's where you have to go to the state level. Here's what it looked like about two weeks ago between Trump and Biden and Iowa. Right? Trump is either depending on who you're, which one you're looking at, you're looking at the Times, Siena, or Emerson, one or two points ahead, okay? We don't need to draw these out to see this, but we've got 3.1 and 3.2 respectively for their margin of errors. They're well within it, which means that statistically speaking, 95 out of 100 times, we're gonna basically be in a dead heat, right? That's what we should expect to find. Five out of those hundred, we would expect there to be enough separation that would be outside of those. Maybe, maybe you get something outside the margin of error, but probably not. So Iowa is competitive. Right? That's one state. You'd have to do this for all the other ones that matter. Some of them you could skip. Like you can skip New York. Right? I have a bold prediction for 2020. I'm calling it now. The Democrats going to win New York. All right. I know it's unpopular, but uh, that is my prediction, and I stand by it. All right, but every other state that does have sort of an impact on what the final tally would be that are toss-ups at this point, Iowa was one of them. I do want to add though, states are harder to do. There are fewer people in them, especially when you get down to a state the size of Iowa, it's, it's tough, right? Coming up with a true predictive model of how each state is gonna go I, I, don't, I would not want to make my living doing that. Um, it's, it's difficult to do because most of them are within that margin of error, right? So yeah, Trump is winning now. Could he be winning in two more weeks? Could he be winning now? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. It's too close. So this is a toss up. This gets into the big question, right? Who's going to turn out to vote? 
That's what it always comes back to. But the only information I can take away from this, at least at this point in time, is I'm not going to put Iowa in, in Trump's Trump's camp yet. I'm going to say it's close. And we'll have to watch carefully come election night. So if you, yeah, this is good. Um, you know, but this is what it looks like, by the way, when you, when you jump into the poll. This is not uncommon. So what this is, is the New York Times Siena College. This is that poll from Iowa registered voters. And it might be a little hard to see, but this is what it looks like if you actually click on that link and it takes you to a PDF. And this is where they're getting all their numbers from. They're breaking it down. And this was a really, really nice uh, cross tabulation that it gave us. I would say a lot of other pollsters don't do this. Um, they don't really give you a lot of cross tabulations, but they did here. And so we can actually do a deeper analysis on this than we could have if it was just the top lines, which is what we were looking at. So we can look at things like gender differences, you know, men versus women. In the definitely going to vote for Trump category, there's a 15 point gap, right? Fewer women are gonna definitely vote for Trump. Or you can go down to definitely gonna vote for Democrat to be named later. There's another gap, 22% for men, 40% for women. That's an 18-point gap. So what would you say about this? You would say that if you were running a campaign in Iowa, that your message is going to be better tailored, if you're a Democrat, to the interests and the policy positions that more women tend to hold. Because that's where your likely base is, and that's who you should be talking to. There's such a gap for men that you're probably better off, I'm not saying ignoring them, but thinking about messaging in the right way. Race and ethnicity, white and Latinos. Again, 13 point gap and the most likely are definitely going to vote for Trump. Gender broken down by, here we're looking at the horse race, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. For Donald Trump, he gets 54% of men, 37% of women. 35% of uh, men for Joe Biden, 53% of women. Education, another area that's been discussed in this particular matchup. Less than high school tends to vote for, uh, well, there's a, the, you, actually they split out pretty well at high school or less, but as you get down to bachelor degrees and then you get to postgraduate degrees, you start to see some significant separation. So Iowa is actually sort of a difference. Uh, it's different than a lot of states here. They don't follow the trends of college degrees. Actually, Trump does pretty well. So things to keep in mind. Again, a poll is just a snapshot in time. Right? It's only as good as the dates in which it was collected. The world changes so fast now, especially with the kind of news cycle that we have, uh, I wouldn't trust those numbers beyond a couple of weeks. Samples are often imperfect. That introduces additional randomness. A ran uh, randomness can be considered noise, in which case the signal is harder to see. So more people saying, I don't know, or they're making selections based on imperfect information, or perhaps they really aren't sure, but they're giving you an answer anyway. These are all things that happen. They happen frequently, and sometimes your sample is to blame. Polls are probabilistic, not deterministic. I cannot say this enough. We place too much emphasis on what a poll can tell, help us predict when in fact it really is about what is the likelihood of this occurring and it's never 100%. And then finally, be on the lookout for things like house biases in polls. Um, it does happen, but it's usually tied to somebody's sampling frame. Um, the one that sort of sticks out in current Public opinion polling is Rasmussen reports. They tend to have a Republican bias. Um, and I, I couldn't tell you exactly why, uh, except that I know it's some, it's some mechanism the way they sample individuals. Um, but without looking at their methodology for, fully, I couldn't tell you exactly what's at play. But they certainly do tend to pull a little bit higher uh, for things like approval ratings uh, and in the head-to-head uh, -head matchups. So you, can, you can generally see this up pretty straight, you know, pretty easily. Trends. Trends are very useful for understanding public opinion because they expand beyond 
what is happening in a snapshot in time. In fact, that's what a trend is. It's multiple snapshots, typically done with the same methodology over many points in time. So you can capture changes, and those changes can be meaningful. There's still noise, because they are a collection of singular poles. Nothing's going to be perfect. But we're looking for a clearer picture, and I think trends do that. So here's an example. I know it's probably impossible to read, but you can look at the Gallup uh, Public Opinion website and play with this. It's actually an interactive map. But just to tell you what you're looking at here, you're looking at the far left of the top. You're looking at Truman's approval rating over the entirety of his presidency, right? So clearly after FDR passes away, he comes into office, he has a very high approval rating, and then there are highs and lows of that presidency. Um, Eisenhower, maybe per, uh, perhaps uh, the most liked on average president uh, over the entirety of his period, um, generally spends most of his time in the positive range. Kennedy gets to spend all of his time in the positive range, although he only had three years, right? So chances are that would have been different if time had gone on. Uh, but Johnson gets a bump and then ends up actually bouncing around. Not nearly as unpopular as you might have guessed if you were thinking about you know the way that we typically portray the 60s. Nixon, well, <laughs> fairly popular. What happened to that guy? Um, and then Ford you know, comes in actually with uh, a reasonably good honeymoon considering uh, where he started, uh, but then you know, kind of bounces around the middle. Uh, Carter comes in higher down and then ends very down. Uh, so pretending the, the election of Reagan, Reagan up and down, but Jen starts to really point to the beginning of uh, the long march to polarization uh, that we are now living in today. And that Bush gets highs through the, uh, the, uh, the first Gulf War, uh, then hits uh, a down economy, and his poll numbers decline, Clinton up and down, and then the boom during the 90s, uh, the, the last part of the 90s goes up, um, although uh, you can kind of see the effect of the impeachment trial in there. You see where it goes down. That is, that is significantly after, but it, it, it is there. And then Bush, obviously George W. Bush, uh, gets incredibly high numbers after 9-11, but you can see the slow march of time. Uh, bring him down to some of the lowest numbers we've seen. Obama, well, sort of what you would expect. And this is where you get to Trump, right? And this is what people are talking about, that Trump has never enjoyed numbers above 50%. He's the only president that's done that. And this is what they're talking about, trends, right? That's not to say Trump hasn't had better moments and worse moments, right? You see the fluctuation on the far right, but it is below 50%. And then if you unpack that in the bottom there, where you can really sort of see it over time, it, it kind of looks like a, almost like a steady heartbeat, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, all the way through, um, but never above 50. It's, it's actually, uh, from a political science standpoint, it's sort of remarkable. Trends are also useful for, for, for discussing issues, right? So here's, uh, Gallup's data on same-sex marriage, uh, all the way through 2019. As you can see, uh, you know, not 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 too long ago, you know, just 20 years ago, right? Minority of support. Um, here is 2015, right? Passage uh, or the legalization of same-sex marriage. It's only gone up since then, right? So the interesting thing about this is, you would ask, is this just part of the natural trend upwards, or is there something about uh, the fact that same-sex marriage is legalized, people sort of accept it, become used to it, and then public opinion follows. It's a chicken or egg question, I don't know. I think with marijuana legalization, though, it's probably actually pretty clear what's going on. There's medical, California, right, 96. Um, reefer madness does not come to pass. People realize <laughs> that they're not gonna go crazy from smoking pot for, for medical reasons. And then you get the passage of recreational, right? So it finally hits that 50% on average tipping point, and look at it go, right? Look at it go. And so more and more, we're getting data out of the states like Colorado and all the others that have passed it since Colorado has. Um, I even point out to, to my students, to remind them that uh, recreational marijuana is actually legal in Alaska, uh, one of the most conservative states in the union. 
to show how popular of an idea it is now. So, challenges. Well, we talked about this a little bit with cell phones. Cell phones are harder to get. They have an age bias to them. Uh, and as people like me, yes, me, uh, who, who's never had a landline of their own, um, move into the, in my age group, moves into more and more of the majority of voters, or the plurality of voters, I should say, this makes public opinion research even harder. So the fact that most of you don't even have a landline anymore means that measuring public opinion is going to continue to face this problem. And who answers their cell phone from a number you don't even understand? Nobody. So you send it to voicemail. It's a real issue. And that is robocalls, right? So probably, how, I don't know how many of you guys are on the do not call list. Does it work? No, I, I've gotten probably this week five calls from the Social Security Administration informing me that my account has been suspended and I need to call them right away. Otherwise, well, it, doesn't, it wasn't really clear. It just said to call them. Um, it didn't seem like a live person. So, you know, that happens and it's happened a lot. You know, it used to be the case you would get a call and you'd get a call from somebody like the Gallup organization. They'd say, we really want to talk to you about your opinions. And you'd actually be kind of excited to weigh in. Nobody wants to talk on the phone anymore. And part of this is because those companies that call you now are telling you it's an opinion survey, but it's not. It's actually them trying to sell you something. Are you currently happy with X, Y, and Z? Oh, you're not? Oh, it just so happens I happen to work for this company. Would you like to hear about the product I have to sell you? We've gotten wise is the problem. We've gotten wise to our phones, and we know that it's not usually a call that we want to answer. And so that coupled with just the oversaturation of this. Everybody has a poll. Uh, everybody's calling you all the time, and it's just something people don't want to do anymore. We're also living online now. This is where we have our meaningful interactions. So it makes sense. We wouldn't probably forever call people on the phone and ask them about things on the phone in a place that's sort of weird, right? The phone is for calling mom or mom calling you is, is probably the case. Um, but you do everything online. You talk to friends online, you message online. It makes sense that we would eventually move to measuring public opinion online. And that's where I think things are going. But not everybody lives online in the same way. Right? There are disparities about who has access, who can pay for access, and then what people are doing with it as well. And as we're finding out more and more, the way in which young people are engaging online evolves. And so public opinion will have to evolve with that too. You know, forever it was, you go to a website. Well, now people don't even like going to websites anymore. They'd rather have it in an app. They'd rather have it in text message, whatever it is. It's changing and it's constantly bringing up new, new challenges. And the last one here, I think is one that falls under the radar a little bit with most people. I did want to spend a moment talking about it. Over the last couple of years, we have gone through a pretty significant political battle over how we're going to run the United States Census. That battle has been particularly over measuring whether or not somebody is in the United States legally. I'm against it. I'm against the question. And it's not for political reasons. It's from a research standpoint. The United States Census is the best survey we have of everybody in America. It's how we know who we are. It's how we know what we're made of. And ultimately, every assumption that we make about what the public thinks is rooted in the United States Census. If we get it wrong, every public opinion poll will be wrong after it. So it's important that we get it right. And so I'm happy the question didn't get on there from a totally non-political perspective because it's important for people like me and everyone else who does work. And if you like knowing exactly what the public thinks, it's important for you too. Betting markets. 
probably should have pulled this today and, and seen how uh, uh, how uh, maybe Deval Patrick was doing in the betting markets. Uh, these are fun, but they actually had some truth to them because this is real money, right? People are actually buying this like they're buying stocks, and you can go. I mean. I think it's legal for Americans to do that. I'm not going to condone it. So I, I don't know. You should do your research if you're going to do this. Uh, certainly you can do this if you're a British citizen. You can bet on the United States presidency. And so this is the couple of weeks ago betting market. I'm one of the, there's multiple. So, you know, um, betting market for, uh, for the uh, Democratic nomination. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is the most expensive, right? And if you're going to vote against her or buy against her, that, that's 67 cents. Uh, Joe Biden only costs 23 cents, so he's probably at a particular low point. Actually, seems like a pretty good deal uh, looking at the data today. <laughs> uh, Buttigieg, 18 cents. And, you know, Sanders, 14. Hillary Clinton, 10 cents. Yeah, that's what I said. She's not running. But, but maybe, I don't know. The betting markets disagree. Betting markets are not counting her out. And if you want to get in early, 10 cents. That's what it'll cost. Uh, Andrew Yang's got nine cents. Klobuchar, four cents. And Bloomberg was on there two weeks ago at three cents. So, you know, there was, a, there was at least a couple, of, a couple of news headlines that came out that suggested that there was some rumblings out of the Bloomberg can. So that's probably what uh, some people said. But keep in mind, if your candidate doesn't get the nomination, you don't get anything. So bet wisely, I guess, or don't bet at all, really. Um, and that gets, and so those are fun. Like if you're looking for more sources of information, things like those are out there, um, and, and they they do sort of help paint a different picture and probably a, it helps complete the picture. Um, I was really happy that uh, 538 had not taken down uh, their final 2016 prediction because I I thought it was sort of instructive to talking about uh, you know whether or not we can trust public opinion research. And so what about 2016, people would say? Well, well, didn't that show that polling was just off? I'd say no. Uh, first of all, it, it did get the popular vote generally right. And I've already, I think, made the case to you that it's hard to do state by state analyses. And so I went through and clicked most of these. And most of the time, they're within the margin of error. Right? So even the public opinion research that we did have which is probably not enough in states like Michigan um, and Pennsylvania, uh, told us that it was close. And we should have probably always seen it as close. Um, conventional wisdom told us that it would, it would break toward Hillary Clinton. And that's the real problem. We relied a lot on conventional wisdom, which we typically do. You typically use what you know to make decisions. Why wouldn't you? But the real problem with 2016 was likely voters were hard to predict, right? There was, and, and this is where you absolutely have to go to Trump's campaign and say, look, they figured out something that a lot of people didn't know and a lot of conventional wisdom didn't tell us. That there were voters out there that they could get that didn't usually turn out to vote, but would for him. And that's what happened. And they also probably knew that there were enough voters that typically would vote for the Democrat that weren't probably going to turn out. And that's what happened. Turnout. It's always turnout. In this case, I think Trump team had a little better idea what that looked like. Uh, do this 95 more times? I don't know. Clinton might win 95 of those. I don't know. It's hard to say. State level contests are hard. So, can I trust public opinion polls going forward? I like to say they got 2018 pretty right. right? They predicted a pretty big wave, and the wave came in. Right? Big dozens of seats changing in Congress. Uh, but it is always important to go back to the states because you look at the Senate contest, and there's a slightly different story there. Right? Not all, it didn't translate into every state all the time. But on the average, it did. Do they match other leading indicators? For example, we like to use things like, who's retiring from Congress? It's one of the better indicators we have early on as to which direction the winds are blowing politically. And in 2018, just as it is so far in 2020, a lot more Republicans are retiring. The polling would match in a generic ballot 
a very plus six, seven, eight, or nine, depending on which poll you look at, Democratic year in 2020. Right now, a year ahead of the election, so, you know, talk to me in like 11 months. So, thinking about 2020, as I'm looking toward understanding polls, what can I incorporate into my knowledge base? Turnout's going to be higher. This is obviously, uh, we, we, you know this is a presidential, it's going to be higher than it was in the midterms or any midterm, but it's going to be higher even for a presidential year. Why? A lot of states were close. Once the state's close, the cat's out of the bag. Turnout goes up. Everybody feels it. Campaigns adapt to it. Everybody starts to behave like it matters. And because they think it matters, they're more likely to vote. 80,000 votes decide this election. It's never been closer, really. And it, it, people, this is widely understood. And it's going to have an effect on turnout. 2018 was the highest midterm turnout in 19, since 1914. I don't see why it would be any different. The person I trust on this is Michael McDonald, the University of Florida. And he says probably 65, 66, or maybe more. That's going to be a record since 1908 if that comes to pass. What does that mean? Um, it means it's going to be harder to predict likely voters because uh, there's going to be new voters, there's going to be inconsistent voters, and there's going to be young voters. New voters are people who just never voted for. They're not necessarily young. Um, inconsistent voters are hard, right? You know, if they don't have a voting history, they don't necessarily have a strong partisan attachment, so they become difficult. New voters are probably angry. <laughs> That's usually what drives people to poll when they're mad. Uh, they tend to vote more uh, if, they're, if they're actually upset about something. Uh, and they tend to, just like young voters, break the democratic way, at least in this election. Angry voters, well, whoever they're angry at is who they vote against. But young voters are probably going to break Democrats. They usually do. And angry voters are going to be angry because they're voting against Donald Trump. So what does this mean? Headwinds for Republicans, tailwinds for Democrats today. You know, this is the best I can tell you today. But it's going to be hard. You know, remember, always think about the state level contests. We can't say much about what's going on nationally because it doesn't translate. As we saw when we looked at Iowa versus the national numbers, it's not a plus eight in Iowa. It's plus one or two Trump. It's the opposite direction. That's a 10 or 11 point swing, depending on which poll you're looking at. But 2020 is going to be hard. I still think the polls will be able to tell us something, but there is that chance hanging out there that we don't quite know what the likely voter model is going to look at. And so that's going to throw a few wrenches into the problem here. So I'm now happy to answer any questions you might have. Two plugs here. We have the revealing of the first Calico School poll. That happens immediately after this talk at 1245. And then I'm, I'm encouraged, and I would, I would say it's, it, you should check out the Hoster Votes podcast uh, on iTunes or Spotify, or I guess you can find it at hoster.edu slash vote, so it's available. Uh, any questions need to go to the microphone uh, in the center, because they are recording this, and they need to capture your beautiful voice. So everyone can hear your question, even future audiences. Oh, good. I'm glad I explained it all. All right, I'll see you guys later. I'm happy to make bad predictions, by the way, and you can just throw them away once I say them. If you can get you to go to the microphone and ask the question. Yeah, please. Uh, a critical issue is voter su su uh, suppression. As in the case of Florida, they suddenly, in the states where they think new young voters or inconsistent voters are, they're challenging. Could you discuss that? So there's a couple things going on in Florida. Um, I assume you're referring to uh, the most recent amendment that they passed, which was supposed to restore uh, uh, voting rights to felons. As I still understand it, it's tied up in the courts. Um, what has happened is they did pass through, um, it's actually a constitutional uh, Revision Commission put a number of reforms out there, just to catch the audience up. 
And one of them was to make it so uh, felons would be allowed to get their Voting Rights Act uh, back once they had uh, fulfilled their, their, their debt to society. There was not clear legislation, as is often the case when you look at ballot measures, there's not usually clear specific elements of implementation in that. So that was left to the legislature. The legislature interpreted it in a very strict way. And part of that strict interpretation was to make it so if there were any sorts of costs, monetary costs associated with it, that they would have to pay those back before being restored their felon, before felons would be restored their voting rights. It is tied up in the courts. And I think the last decision was actually uh, against the legislature. So this may sort of settle itself out uh, before then. But um, there is a question about how this, because it was, it was in the tune of a couple million, or at least a million, I think. was, was And so that, some, that this would break for the Democrats in a major way. But um, there's a lot of cases like this. Uh, so it, you, you look at felon rights, uh, or, or, or uh, post, post you know, felony rights versus, say, uh, it, it depends on the state. There's no real sort of guidelines federally on how to do that. Um, but other examples of this have been, you know, voter ID laws. Uh, and in the case of Florida, they've, they've also tinkered with like early voting and stuff like that. Um, the effects can matter. Uh, it, it will matter most likely. It's not a huge effect, right? Uh, maybe the maybe the, uh, the voting restoration might be. We don't know. We've never seen it, so we have no baseline. But um, in close races, it'll be it'll be it'll be important. So. Is Florida gonna be close? Probably, yeah. So, yeah, it matters. Um, but in in a, in a case of a blowout election, it won't really matter. But in Florida, I think it does. And uh, ultimately, you know, these things so far at the Supreme Court level, they they sort of deferred to the states on them. Um, and the current composition of the Supreme Court suggests that they probably will continue to do so. So the battleground for those sorts of policies is at the state level. You know, you get you get what you elect, right? If you elect conservatives to your legislature, you tend to get conservative policy, and that's what they have in Florida. Uh, they have a Republican-dominated legislature and a Republican governor, so we shouldn't expect it to change anytime soon. Uh, groups have taken a different course, and they've gone through the courts, and they've had mixed success there. So it will be battled out through probably <laughs> most of next year. I don't have a clear picture of how it's going to go at this point. Are there circumstances where it's in the best interest of a special interest group to lie to a pollster? I guess I could ask you to give me a, give me an example. What are you what are you thinking? Uh, for example, if a candidate has limited resources, would the effect of the poll uh, help them? Or even if they have a lot of resources? So, like a push poll or something like that. Is that what you're kind of thinking? Like they get some sort of well, like. For example, Biden is ahead in many polls, but mm -hmm. he seems to be affected by any fluctuation by a point or so in terms of the media. And in some cases, I guess a candidate with limited resources may be knocked out or given a big push by the results of a poll. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, in terms of qualifying for the debates, right, which is really kind of what the candidates at the lower tiers are after, because to Biden, right, him coming in at 26 or 27 ultimately doesn't matter. He's going to be in the next debate. That's enough to qualify. But for those candidates who are, who are bouncing around 2 or 3 percent, they do have an incentive to try to game the system. But if, if, you're, if you're a pollster doing your job in, in a way that, that would be approved by the regulatory or the, the sort of professional organization, which is the Association of American uh, uh, Public Opinion Research, APOR, um, then you would not engage in that sort of uh, tactic, right? You, you would just run your poll normally. So could you game it? Yeah. Would it be hard? I would think so. I mean, you, you'd, you'd have a really hard time doing that. Now, if you were um, trying to change, so, so there's an interesting thing that comes up, though, as I think about this, um, and that's a question about how much does polling influence what people think. So could a candidate go out there and, and maybe uh, bomb a state with information that's false about how well the candidate's doing 
and it's just not based in reality. And then do people respond to that going, oh, wow, I didn't know that that person was doing so well. Yeah, you could probably shift public opinion a little bit because viability matters a lot in the eyes of the voter, right? So if I think a candidate is viable, that's the first thing that goes through my mind. Do I want to spend my one vote for this person if they don't even have a chance? And that's why you look for uh, those sorts of fluctuations where you start to see someone tick up and then you see the sort of snowballing effect because more and more people look at that going, hey, they're getting on the bandwagon. I think I might do that too. The last time that happened and actually ended in the way that, that it sort of just snowballed all the way to the, to the nomination was, was Obama, right? So it wasn't really until right before the Iowa caucuses that he started to get traction in the polls. So if I was a, um, a desperate candidate, I might commission a fake poll uh, that makes me look like I'm getting 10 points or something like that and try to disseminate that information. Most news agencies would, would know better, but you know certainly things like push polling has, has happened before. Thanks. So we have the um, primaries in Iowa and New Hampshire, and obviously those results affect the subsequent primaries. And I was just wondering how polling and I guess public opinion in those particular states ends up affecting the general, uh, well, the subsequent primaries and general election. So we, we do have sort of an odd mix of, of states as our first primary states, right? I mean, why do we look to Iowa for any guidance uh, except on corn prices, um, which I trust them on. And, but it is, it's sort of, it's sort of a strange state to start with, but, and, and then their process is very strange on top of that, right? They don't run a traditional primary, they do a caucus. So it's not, you have to really, really, really be excited about your candidate or really feel strongly enough about participation that you get up off your couch and go down to the caucus area and caucus for however long it takes to produce a winner. And, and it just, that, that's not that, that those are sort of weird people, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's to be, to be quite frank, like most, most normal average sort of of the spectrum aren't doing that. So what does Iowa tell us? Well, it tells us probably something about the activist part of the party and that we can take away where the energy is maybe a little bit. And that's probably what translates into future contests. Uh, is it representative of America? No. Is it representative of any particular party? Probably not. But it is information. It is the first information that we get. And so it does, in fact, play into those questions of, is this candidacy viable? Um, is this something that people are actually considering? Or in the case of really what I think Iowa can tell us is, um, where's some of the excitement? at in this party because that's usually who sort of ends up winning or coming in sort of a surprise finish in terms of new hampshire um their their traditional primary uh they you know they they'll, they'll be able to tell us something about where some candidates are standing i don't think anybody th really thinks the first two are important for like a front runner to win although you don't want to finish so poorly that it looks like you know you lost but in terms of, like, say, a Biden or something like that, if he finishes third in Iowa, I think that's a pretty good finish for him. If he finishes second in New Hampshire, I think that's fine. Uh, South Carolina, not a Democratic state, but does tell us something about one of the core bases of the Democratic Party. So there is something to learn there. Uh, Nevada, again, a little bit different, but still some piece of information. Again, a caucus state. Super Tuesday is really kind of where we separate the wheat from the chaff, right? So that's, but in, if you're a not very well-known, not extremely well-funded candidate, and the best you can do is sort of go around and get your name out there, you have to do well in those states. You have to build momentum, right? And so that's several weeks that gives you a chance to do that. Um, yeah, I don't know that it tells us who's going to the winner is going to be, but it gives us some sense of what's going on in the field. So it's not it's not 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 bad information. It's just not predictive information. Thank you. Yep. So uh, this is kind of a little bit of asking your opinion, but 
we've seen a, a real preponderance of discussion about polls, discussion about uh, kind of where candidates stand in them. Do you think that uh, the media focus on that takes away from actual substantive discussions and turns it into more of a horse race and more of something that's about electability as opposed to about ideas? Well, the, the model, you know, the media model is to, is to get more people to pay attention. And so the function uh, is to is different than what maybe is actually important, right? And what's the undercurrent of what's going on? So it's natural for news media to focus on horse race because that's quite frankly the most headline grabbing thing that there is, right? It's what we ultimately want to know: who's winning, who's going to win, right? So uh, I would not fault the media at all for doing that because that's what everybody else wants to hear. Um, the concept of electability is an interesting one. Um, what can you really know about it this far out? I don't know. Um, there are plenty, uh, you know, that Trump wasn't electable either, right? So, I mean, you can't really say a whole lot about what the concept of electability is because it, it, the, the matchup matters so much. And the election matters a lot, right? What happens during the election that actually leads some percentage of voters who really won't have made up their mind to ultimately make up their mind. So whether or not somebody's electable, sure, you know, that matters on some, some, some sort of surface level, but individual decision making is not going to be wrapped up in whether I think they're electable or not, especially once you get down to two candidates, right? It, for a lot of people, it, it's gonna be personal. You know, do I like this person? Do I not like this person? Um, some people will be a single issue that drives them. Does this person support the issue that I care about? Yes or no? Uh, or is it going to be some some sort of protest vote? Is it going to be some kind of box of issues that, that matter to me? There's in, 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 pick any individual voter, and they have an individual reason as to why they came to that conclusion. So uh, again, I think for the media, it makes sense because that's what you're not going to spend all day talking about, you know, what, what, what did the poll say? Well, if you, if you go down three levels, it says this. No, that's, that's not really what's going to sell them the newspapers or get more eyeballs on the TV. It's about short pieces of information that people can understand. So the function is different, but people who watch elections carefully and really want to understand know to go deeper than to just look at the, the horse race polls. Great. Thank you. You got it. Oh. Hi. Um, so um, given the current uh, social climate, uh, how much of a role does the Bradley effect uh, play? And um, how, do, how does your average pollster account for it? Well, I don't know that we have a good accounting of the Bradley effect. I mean, I think a lot of people thought it would be there in 2008, and it kind of wasn't. Um, I mean, so you, you, one, you'd have to nominate um, one of the people of color to be able to really tease that out. Um, I would say probably more than anything else, I see a gender bias in the stuff that I've seen lately more than I see a racial bias. Um, it's probably still there. I don't know that there's any way you can truly account for it. Um, generally speaking, you want to take people at their word when they're answering these surveys. Um, I will say, though, that um, there is a difference in mode, right? So if you're asking somebody on the phone or in person, there's that personal interaction there. So if I call you on the phone and I'm asking you who you're gonna vote for, you recognize that I'm a, another person and I have my own beliefs. And even though I'm gonna not judge you, I'm gonna try not to judge you, you can't help but think that what is this person thinking about me as I say these answers, right? And so if you say to yourself, well, I'm voting for Trump, but uh, I don't know I want to reveal that to just some random person calling me, right? That I think is somewhat likely, and you might see a depressive effect in the type of mode, whether it be for Trump or whether it be for somebody of color or for a woman. Um, and that's where actually I think one of the more distinct advantages of online polling is, is that you're not interacting with a person anymore. It's just a computer that sends your information somewhere and you never really have to engage with the idea of what is this person thinking about me? And you know that 
your data are being anonymized. And so you're never going to get tracked back to this. No one at your job is going to find out or anything like that. And I think people are more honest. You know, all, this, all the research and public opinion uh, on this particular difference of motive found that people are more honest about things that they feel insecure about or they think are socially undesirable. So whether it's certain kinds of behaviors like smoking or whatever, that society has said this is not something you should do, uh, or if it's that you're embarrassed about how you think politically, the online format actually tends to capture a little bit more of an honest picture of how people behave than they do in the phone. And so, you know, I look at some of the polls right now and I wonder to what extent are people holding back information? And I think they are, a little bit. Um, is there any concrete way to account for that? Not really. Not that I know of, anyway. Since I'm already here, can I have one more question? Yeah, sure, of course. Okay. Um, so how do you, um, online polls, um, they uh, track IP, usually the uh, more um, reliable ones, but they can still be gamed. How do you account for that as a serious bolster? Um, so that's a good question, um, and you're right. Uh, there are formats that, so I've used them all in some fashion or not at this point. Um, there are services out there like MTurk, right? So this is Amazon's Mechanical Turk. It is a service in which you can pay people um, small amounts of money typically to perform some sort of task. Uh, I've used it and I will not use the data from it. And it's because uh, I know that the majority of the respondents I get are from out of the country. Yeah, that's because I have their IP addresses, and I can see that they're from, in lots of times, places from Eastern Europe, places where they could probably understand English, but uh, you know, maybe the job market's not so great, and that this is actually a decent way to make money. Um, so I won't personally use their data, and I don't trust it. Uh, if you were doing an experiment, it, <laughs> maybe, uh, and, and there are ways to try to increase the quality of, of that sample, but uh, there's always going to be people who can work around that, right? So they can use IP, uh, they can use uh, VPNs and things to pretend like they're from America. Uh, so I won't use that. And then there are other samples that you can get uh, that that tend to check out, uh, but they're just they're much more opt-in samples, and you run into questions about who's opting in. They tend to skew more democratic. They tend to skew more female than than what you would want in a regular sample. And then there are the more high quality sources of which, you know, to give a plug to it, uh, what we're talking about in, in about 10 minutes here, is are, are those like YouGov and Ipsos. And they, they actually know the people who they are, right? And they're confirmed American citizens, they, you know, for example, YouGov has 200, uh, 2 million Americans in their panel, uh, 8 million people all over the world. And these are verified people. They're recruited and they're screened. And so the quality in knowing that that person, and, and one, I never get that information. That's totally anonymized for me. But they know who it is. And so long as they're seen as reputable and I see them as such, um, you can trust it. But yeah, just going out there and running a poll, you're going to run into these sorts of problems. And it's, it's a very wise of you to be aware of them.